Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's lecture examines a phase sequence detector circuit. Our objective is to discuss phase sequence and its critical role in the production, transmission, and use of three-phase AC power. We'll examine an application of unbalanced three-wire Y configuration that can be used to detect phase sequence. This lecture operates under the presumption the viewer has more than a passing familiarity with three-phase AC and unbalanced Y configured loads, as illustrated in the Introduction of Three-Phase AC and Unbalanced Y Configurations lectures both available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched these lectures yet or only didn't recall their contents, please take the time to do so now. You are no doubt aware that a three-phase AC system is characterized by three voltage waveforms with the same magnitude and frequency offset from each other by a relative 120 degrees. A common light industrial three-phase AC system available in the United States is characterized by 120 volt line to neutral differentials, 208 volt line to line differentials with an excitation frequency of 60 Hertz. Represented as a function of time, these waveforms almost appear identical, only the degree of phase shift distinguishes one waveform from another. Represented as phasor equivalents, with phase L1 assumed to be the reference, L1 in black would be 120 volts at an angle of 0 degrees, L2 in red would be 120 volts at an angle of negative 120 degrees, and L3 in blue would be 120 volts at an angle of 120 degrees. Several equally relevant observations can be made using either the plot of voltage as a function of time or the phase of representation. It can be said L2 lags L1 by 120 degrees just as easily as it can be said L1 leads L2 by 120 degrees. Similarly, it can be said that L3 lags L2 by 120 degrees just as easily as it can be said L2 leads L3 by 120 degrees. It can also be said that L1 lags L3 by 120 degrees just as easily as it can be said that L3 leads L1 by 120 degrees. In summary, each waveform exhibits a relative phase shift of 120 degrees with respect to the other waveforms. Given L1 is established as our frame of reference, we can state L1 peaks, then L2, then L3. When discussing phase sequence, it's helpful to remind ourselves that these waveforms are repetitive in nature. When extended for another cycle, the same sequence repeats itself. L1 peaks, then L2, then L3. It should be noted that waveform L1, our initial point of reference, needn't always be considered the reference, and other points of reference can be employed. Consider L2 in red as the reference. Representative phasor equivalents with phase L2 assumed to be the reference, L2 in red would be 120 volts at an angle of 0 degrees, L3 in blue would be 120 volts at an angle of negative 120 degrees, and L1 in black would be 120 volts at an angle of 120 degrees. As previously, using the plot of voltage as a function of time or the phasor representation, the sequence of these three waveforms can be determined. Given L2 is established as our frame of reference, we can state L2 peaks, then L3, then L1. When extended for another cycle, the sequence again repeats itself, L2, L3, L1. Given the repetitive nature of these waveforms, it should be noted that the choice of reference has not changed the phase sequence, only the starting point within the same sequence. Finally, consider L3 in blue as the reference. Represented as phasor equivalents with phase L3 assumed to be the reference, L3 in blue would be 120 volts at an angle of 0 degrees. L1 in black would be 120 volts at an angle of negative 120 degrees, and L2 in red would be 120 volts at an angle of 120 degrees. As previously, using the plot of voltage as a function of time or the phasor representation, the sequence of these three waveforms can be determined. Given L3 is established as our frame of reference, we can state L3 peaks, then L1, then L2. When extended for another cycle, the sequence would again repeat itself, L3, L1, L2. Given the repetitive nature of these waveforms, it should again be noted that the choice of reference has not changed the phase sequence, only the starting point within the same sequence. When we compare these three different analyses, you'll note the cyclical behavior of three-phase AC demonstrates that black-red-blue is the same as red-blue-black, which is the same as blue-black-red. This is to imply that phase sequence for a three-phase AC distribution system is fixed and unalterable, where the relationship of L1, L2, and L3 is determined well in advance by the physical construction and rotational direction of the generator producing three-phase AC. Unless you are the generator, you have absolutely no influence over the phase sequence of a three-phase AC system. This being said, at the point of use, a technician can apply the different phases in whatever manner they deem suitable for the application in question. As detailed in the Rotating Magnetic Field Lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech Channel, 
we learn that three-phase AC establishes a rotating magnetic field in the stator, which the rotor follows with an established rotational speed and torque. As a summary of the process, when voltage at a particular pole peaks, it establishes a magnetic pole which the rotor follows. Consider a three-phase AC motor wired in the following fashion. Phase L1 is landed at terminal A, phase L2 is landed at terminal B, and phase L3 is landed at terminal C. Given the previously established phase sequence, it can be said that as L1 voltage peaks, it establishes a magnetic pole at terminal A. Then as L2 voltage peaks, it establishes a magnetic pole at terminal B. Then as L3 voltage peaks, it establishes a magnetic pole at terminal C. And the process repeats itself, ABC, ABC, establishing counterclockwise rotation. If phase L1 gets off the bus, and L2 and L3 each move forward one seat, and L1 gets back on the bus and takes a seat in the rear, really not much has changed regarding the sequence, only the starting point within the same sequence. As L1 voltage peaks, it establishes a magnetic pole at terminal C. Then as L2 voltage peaks, it establishes a magnetic pole at terminal A. Then as L3 voltage peaks, it establishes a magnetic pole at terminal B. And the process repeats itself, CAB, CAB, again establishing counterclockwise rotation. Similarly, if phase L2 gets off the bus and L3 and L1 each move forward one seat and L2 gets back on the bus and takes a seat in the rear, again, really not much has changed regarding the sequence, only the starting point within the same sequence. As L1 voltage peaks, it establishes a magnetic pole at terminal B. Then as L2 voltage peaks, it establishes a magnetic pole at terminal C. Then as L3 voltage peaks, it establishes a magnetic pole at terminal A and the process repeats itself, BCA, BCA again establishing counterclockwise rotation. Really the only change in behavior for this system at the point of use occurs when any two phases swap seats on the bus. Consider L1 in seat B and L2 in seat A. Given the previously established phase sequence, it can be said that as L1 voltage peaks, it establishes a magnetic pole at terminal B. Then as L2 voltage peaks, it establishes a magnetic pole at terminal A. Then as L3 voltage peaks, it establishes a magnetic pole at terminal C, and the process repeats itself, BAC, BAC, establishing clockwise rotation. This is opposite to our earlier observations and critical to applications such as reversing motor starters, in which a motor must operate in both the forward and reverse direction. Simply by swapping any two applied phases, our motor will rotate in the opposite direction. You'll find similar clockwise rotational behavior with L1 landed at A, L2 landed at C, and L3 landed at B, where the magnetic poles established by the stator rotates from A to C to B and back again, ACB, ACB established in clockwise rotation. Finally, you'll find similar behavior with L1 landed at C, L2 landed at B, and L3 landed at A, where the magnetic poles established by the stator rotates from C to B to A and back again, CBA, CBA established in clockwise rotation. The larger point being that phase sequence established by a three-phase AC source between L1, L2, and L3 is fixed and unalterable. However, they can be applied at the point of use in any manner deemed suitable for the application. Wired in one fashion, a motor would drive a conveyor belt forward and send an elevator up. Wired in another fashion, a motor would drive the same conveyor backward and send the elevator down. Understandably, a user should have some idea of the phase sequence prior to wiring up a motor as it is a generally recommended practice to avoid driving a conveyor backwards when you press the forward button, and it kind of sucks to have an elevator go up when you're on the top floor or down when you're on the bottom. Oftentimes, primary wires might lack proper labels and might not use identifying colors above a certain gauge. A user might be presented with three otherwise indistinguishable black wires, each with the same line-to-line -line differential between them, and be left to simply guess the phase sequence. An extremely easy solution to this problem is to first display the waveforms on an oscilloscope to determine the phase sequence. The problem is, not everyone has an oscope, not everyone knows how to use an oscope if they have one, and even if you have one and you know how to use it, which I'm certain you do, using an oscope takes some time and effort. An extremely efficient and practical solution to this problem can be found in the form of a phase sequence detector, a practical application of an unbalanced three-wire Y circuit constructed from two light bulbs and a capacitor. Long story short, one of the light bulbs will light up if the phase sequence is ABC, and the other will light up if the sequence is BAC. The capacitor in the third branch purposely establishes an imbalance such that imbalance current continues to circulate throughout the unbalanced Y configuration, and voltage across the two bulbs will not be the same. 
As a result, the bulb with the leading phase appears brighter. A user simply plugs the three unknown primary wires into the phase sequence detector and gets immediate feedback without having to resort to an oscilloscope. A phase sequence detector is a quick and easy means of determining phase sequence, although the theory behind its operation isn't. This being said, it's not that hard if you understand the superposition theorem. Let's use the remainder of this lecture as an opportunity to practice the analysis techniques I demonstrated in the Unbalanced Y Configurations lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. A phase sequence detector circuit can be constructed using an unbalanced three-wire Y configuration featuring two identical light bulbs, ZA and ZB, each modeled as having an impedance of 300 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees, and a 2.2 microfarad capacitor, ZC, having an impedance of roughly 1.2 kilo ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees at an excitation frequency of 60 Hz. If the phase sequence detector is plugged into an unknown three-phase AC system, the two bulbs will indicate the phase sequence of the unknown system. If bulb A is brighter, the sequence is ABC. If bulb B is brighter, the sequence is BAC. Let's initially assume our phase sequence detector is hooked up in the following fashion. Phase L1 to terminal A, phase L2 to terminal B, and phase L3 to terminal C. Ideally, our calculation should demonstrate light bulb A will be brighter. Let's see if this is the case. Let's apply the superposition theorem from the top down. First L1, then L2, then L3, then a final summation accounted for not only magnitude and phase shift, but also polarity and direction. To analyze this system from the perspective of source L1 only, we remove sources L2 and L3 by substituting a short circuit or low impedance path. This modification has fundamentally changed the nature of our original circuit. It appears as if ZB, one of the light bulbs, is in parallel with ZC, our capacitor, a simplification I'm calling Z single prime. The parallel combination of ZB and ZC presents a combined impedance of 291 ohms at an angle of negative 14 degrees. ZA and Z single prime appear to be perfectly in series with one another. This is a perfect setup for the AC voltage divider rule. We know applied voltage and we know both impedances in a series combination of two elements. An application of the AC voltage divider rule demonstrates VA to be 61.4 volts at an angle of 6.9 degrees, where assumed directional polarity positive to negative is left to right. An application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates V single prime to be the remaining 59.5 volts at an angle of negative 7.1 degrees, where assumed directional polarity positive to negative is right to left. Given combined impedance Z single prime is in fact the parallel combination of ZB and ZC, it can be said both VB and VC are also equal to 59.5 volts at an angle of negative 7.1 degrees. Let's put these values aside and solve for properties for the remaining sources. Similarly, to analyze this system from the perspective of only source L2, we remove sources L1 and L3 by substituting a short circuit or low impedance path. This modification has fundamentally changed the nature of our original circuit. It appears as if ZA, one of the light bulbs, is in parallel with ZC, the capacitor a simplification I'm calling Z double prime. The parallel combination of ZA and ZC also presents a combined impedance of 291 ohms at an angle of negative 14 degrees. ZB and Z double prime appear to be perfectly in series with one another. This is again a perfect setup for the AC voltage divider rule. We know applied voltage and we know both impedances in a series combination of two elements. An application of the AC voltage divider rule demonstrates VB to be 61.4 volts at an angle of negative 113.1 degrees where assumed directional polarity positive to negative is left to right. An application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates V double prime to be the remaining 59.5 volts at an angle of negative 127.1 degrees, where assumed directional polarity positive to negative is right to left. Given a combined impedance Z double prime is in fact the parallel combination of ZA and ZC, it can be said both VA and VC also equal 59.5 volts at an angle of negative 127.1 degrees with the same polarity. Let's put these values aside and solve for properties for the remaining source. Finally, to analyze this system from the perspective of only source L3, we remove sources L1 and L2 by substituting a short circuit or low impedance path. This modification has fundamentally changed the nature of our original circuit. It appears as if both light bulbs, ZA and ZB, are in parallel with one another, a simplification I'm calling Z triple prime. The parallel combination of ZA and ZB presents a combined impedance of 150 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees. ZC and Z triple prime appear to be perfectly in series with one another. This is again a perfect setup for the AC voltage divider rule. We know applied voltage and we know both impedances in a series combination of two elements. An application of the AC voltage divider rule demonstrates VC to be 119.1 volts 
at an angle of 112.9 degrees, or assume directional polarity positive to negative is left to right. An application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates V triple prime to be the remaining 14.9 volts at an angle of negative 157.1 degrees, or assume directional polarity positive to negative is right to left. Given combined impedance, Z triple prime is in fact the parallel combination of ZA and ZB, it can be said both VA and VB also equal 14.9 volts at an angle of negative 157.1 degrees with the same polarity. Let's put these values aside and now summate our previous results. Accounting for not only magnitude and phase shift, but also polarity, it can be demonstrated that load impedance ZA experiences a voltage drop of 126.1 volts at an angle of 28.7 degrees, where assumed directional polarity positive to negative is left to right. Similarly, accounting for not only magnitude and phase shift, but also polarity, it can be demonstrated load impedance ZB experiences a voltage drop of 81.8 volts at an angle of negative 148.1 degrees, where assumed polarity positive to negative is left to right. Finally, accounting for not only magnitude and phase shift, but also polarity, it can be demonstrated load impedance ZC experiences a voltage drop of 178.6 volts at an angle of 112.9 degrees, where assumed polarity positive to negative is left to right. Given the observed voltage differentials, it should be obvious that light A would be brighter than light B, a clear indicator that the phase sequence is ABC and not BAC. Again, this level of analysis is not necessary for practical application of the three-phase AC sequence detector, but rather it serves to demonstrate and verify the theory of operation of an unbalanced three-wire Y configuration. If you need more practice with unbalanced three-wire Y configuration analysis, as an exercise to the viewer, I invite you to solve for voltage across each light for any and as many combination of connections your little cold heart desires. If you think about it, the circuit presents five additional opportunities to tackle the analysis of unbalanced three-wire Y configurations using the superposition theorem. Ultimately, you should observe light A to be brighter for the following configurations, L2 to A, L3 to B, and L1 to C, and L3 to A, L1 to B, and L2 to C, and light B to be brighter for the following configurations, L2 to A, L1 to B, L3 to C, L1 to A, L3 to B, L2 to C, and L3 to A, L2 to B, and L1 to C. You'd be crazy to try to solve for every single combination, but here's the results you'd observe when L2 is landed on terminal A, L1 is landed on terminal B, and L3 is landed on terminal C. As we'd anticipate, given the calculated voltage differentials, it should be obvious that light B would be brighter than light A, a clear indicator that the phase sequence is BAC and not ABC. All right, that's about it for today. In conclusion, this lecture discuss phase sequence and examine the theory of operation and practical application of a phase sequence detector circuit. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.